Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, March 29th, and we're picking up in Bereshit, chapter 19, and approximately verse 19. We have come through the time where the two angelic visitors spared Lot from, uh, from being crushed at the very least, and possibly more happening to him at the door to his house, as the men of Sodom wanted to get to those angels. Uh, they did not succeed. But we know that judgment is going to fall on Sodom, that the angels have to get Lot and his family out so the judgment can fall because God's wrath does not fall on his believers. We saw last week, and I'll bring that out again because I'm not sure if it was towards the end where you might not have retained it. But Second Kepha, Second Peter chapter 2, gives us a view of how God saw Lot. You may wonder why Lot was spared, but this is how God saw it. Chapter 2, verse 7 of uh, 2 Peter says, And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and he heard that righteous man while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. We saw how Lot had moved down in progression, in backsliding. He moved, looked toward Sodom, moved toward it, then he moved into it, then he became part of the government. He might have been buying himself off the whole time saying that he was there to be a witness to them and to draw them out, but very often when one goes in that way into a compromising situation, they do not bring others out, they end up falling into it also. Obviously, Lot was not living that lifestyle, but he was mixing with them. He even tried to reach out to them, calling them brothers. So we see there was, you know, um, friendships at least that, that were formed there. And yet, if his desire was to go into their world to bring them out, he did not succeed. They thought when he tried to preach at them, they took it as foolishness. You you who are living among us, you've come to judge us, and they did not see anything of value in what he had said or lived among them to bring them to their knees for forgiveness, and instead uh, they, they turned against him. We see that Lot was vexed. His, his conscience and his soul was troubled, probably because he knew he should be in an atmosphere like that, yet it wasn't, he wasn't yielding to it and coming out from it. He had too much of the world to be happy in the Lord. He had too much of the Lord to be happy in the world. He was in a miserable, miserable spot. So the, the angels give him a chance to reach family members outside of his house. We believe that they were probably the betrothed husbands of his daughters. And uh, he, they did not come in. By morning time, as the sun's about to rise, the angels are telling them, we've got to go now. And literally, the two had to take Lot and his wife and the two daughters by their hands and forcefully bring them out of town. They were hanging on. They were not uh, breaking free, maybe hoping that the others would come. But obviously, if they were going to come, they would have come by then. So they, they brought them out. And uh, then I think it's verse... Oh, I've got to go back to Genesis, sorry. I think it's verse 19, or, okay, um, 18, 17 tells them to go. Don't look back, don't stay in the surrounding area, <clears throat> escape to the mountains, or you'll be swept away. They'll, they will suffer in the punishment that was coming. And a lot of panics in verse 18. No, no, verse 19, if I found favor, let me escape to this little city. And it goes on through these next verses that we did last week. He wants to go to Zoar. Uh, Zoar means little. It's not that it was named that because of this. It, it was already that name. But he is told that he can go. Uh, it sounds pretty much like he's still trying to cling to a shred of the world that he's just not, yes, getting with the program. <laughs> All that one that you just read, uh, why would he think if he escaped to the mountains, at least, some evil will take him and will die. Okay, he, he could have thought in the mountains he would be um, unable to take care of himself. He could have thought, I'm going to come into where Abraham is and I'm so ashamed I don't want to see Abraham. There were many reasons in his mind that he could have been um, trying to reason out 
But what he was not doing is realizing if the Lord was bringing him out, he would depend on the Lord. The Lord would take care of him, and he needs to follow and be obedient to where the Lord says go. So um, I cannot tell you exactly why, but uh, there could be a lot of reason behind you know what he was thinking. Uh, might have even been that he just thought it would be a harder life up there, and he wanted where it would be easier. You know, the disaster will overtake me. I will die. Like, it's just too much for me. I'm too weak. I can't to do that. Uh, I can't tell you any more than that, but those are ideas that it could be. So um, uh, the angel said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. I think I'm reading the wrong... Let me get into, let me just read in order. I tried to skip to hurry, but I shouldn't have. Verse 20, now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it's small. See, I think he thought the journey's too much. He didn't want to have to go all the way to the mountains. It would have been the mountains of Moab. They, are, they aren't called that yet, but they will be called that in Scripture. <laughs> Please let me escape there. Is it not s small? So that my life might be saved. So he's, he's begging for this, and he said to him, behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. So the angel is saying, okay, because remember Avraham had begged, if there's ten righteous, will you not spare the city? So where, where Lot's going to go because he's righteous, that city is going to be spared. And that's what they're saying, but they're telling him, hurry, escape there, go, I can't do anything till you arrive. And the place that he's going to go by his choice then is Zoar, rather than into the mountains. We're going to see he doesn't stay in Zoar, though. Now, we know this was happening pre-dawn and coming into, you know, it's been during the night because, remember, the men came into the city at nighttime. They couldn't stay in the city square. Lot had brought them into his home for safety. Now we see by verse 23, the sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to <laughs> Zoar. So he's traveling during that nighttime uh, or pre-dawn, I should say more clearly, because I think as the sun was starting to rise is when the angel said, move it, you got to go, you have to go now. And so um, they're, they're hurrying them along. Um, it may have taken him a little time in, you know, in other words, they're not going five minutes away is what I'm trying to say. But they're, you know, they're not going... It's not going to take them days to get out of the area of danger. So they're on their way. Verse 23, the sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. He made it to the little city that was close by. As soon as he did, then, verse 24, then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Amorah from the Lord out of heaven. Okay, let's stop right there and let's realize that this is the, uh, the first time that we're reading about brimstone. And when we look at brimstone in scripture, we see that that denotes judgment in the Bible. Let me give you examples. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Okay, Deuteronomy, Davarim, chapter 29. And we will start with verse 23. We'll read 23 and 24. Deuteronomy 29, verses 23 and 24. All its land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown, unproductive, no grass grows in it, like the overthrow of Saddam and Morah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger, in his wrath. So it happened to two other places also, according to Davarim, Deuteronomy 29, 23, and 24. Now look at the book of Job, Job. And Job chapter 18, we're going to look at verses 5 and 15. Job 18, verses 5 and 15. Indeed, the light of the wicked goes out, the flame of his fire gives no light. And then verse 15 says, There dwells in his tent nothing of his. Brimstone is scattered on his habitation. So we see that this fire that, that's going out in verse 5, we see as brimstone in verse 15, and it's leaving everything desolate. Go into the Psalms, the very next book after Job. Go into Psalm or Tehillim number 11, Psalm 11. And verse 6, and here we read, Upon the wicked he, God, will rain snares, 
Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. Obviously, God's judgment. Again, brimstone. Look with me to Isaiah, Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah 30, verses 31 and 33. Verse 31, for the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be terrified when he strikes with the rod. And verse 33, for Topheth has long been ready. Indeed, it's been prepared for the king. He has made it deep and large, a pyre of fire with plenty of food, uh, sorry, plenty of wood. The breath of the Lord, like a torrent of brimstone, sets it afire. You can see it's bringing judgment and death. That was Job. Job. Isaiah, what? Isaiah was chapter 30. It's in your cross-references if you got those from me. And then we went on. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was Isaiah 30, 31, and 33 that I just read. Job was earlier. Okay. Let's try Ezekiel. Ezekiel. We want to go to Ezekiel chapter 38. And we know this is battle chapters 38 and 39. I believe it is part of the end time battles. 38 and 22, yes, 38, 22 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38, 22, with pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment with him. I will reign on him and on his troops and on the many people who are with him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And the I in that verse is God. Now go with me to Revelation, where we are in tribulation times, Revelation chapter 9. Uh, a lot has taken place by the time we get to chapter 9. We're in the fifth trumpet, uh, ch sixth trumpet also. Chapter 9, verses 17 and 18. And this is how I, sit, how I saw the vision, the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire and hyacinth and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses are like the heads of the lions. Out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, fire, smoke, brimstone, uh, which proceeded out of their mouths. So all the way through from Bereshit, Genesis to Revelation now, you've seen, I've stopped in a number of places, but brimstone has always been judgment. It's judgment, I believe, uh, from God. I don't see it in, in any other source. Sorry, I'm having what trouble. Revelation 9, what was the verse? 17 and 18. Thank you. Yes. Um, now, brimstone is usually associated with sulfur. Um, it's used for any inflammable substance, and that means easy to set on fire. If you've got brimstone, it, it ignites easily and quickly sulfur also. There are those who try to define what this brimstone was that took out Saddam and Amorah. There are those who say that they think it was a volcanic eruption. And there is evidence of volcanic eruptions in the area. There are rocks that are formed from lava and from volcanic ash that are around there. So they think that God used volcanic activity. And we know out of a volcano comes fire. So it could, it could appear to be like that. Another view is that it was a great earthquake. That this earthquake was in association with a violent electrical storm which was a supernatural fire from God. Mm -hmm. And they say that because the great rift area that goes through here from Mount Hermon up on the north, it goes all the way down south to Egypt, is along the Jordan, along the Dead Sea, along uh, uh, the Arva Valley. It's called the Arva Rift, in fact. And it's a very active region for earthquakes also. But there were a few key things in there I had a little trouble with. If you didn't pick them up, I'll tell you in a moment. The asphalt pits in the valley, in the Vale of Siddim that we read about in chapter 14, and we saw that was sticky, that those who tried to flee got stuck in them. It was, it was oozy and, and sticky and burning. Um, so they, they indicate that that kind of um, material, chemical material, is in the soil in that area, and that's very combustible. So an earthquake, they say, would have released uh, all the, 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 um, Okay, let me read it. Combustible hydrocarbons and sulfur. And then lightning or fire from heaven igniting that mixture, you would have had an explosion and you would have had a devastating fire. 
Now, why all these theories, what are they trying to figure out? It's because they don't see Sodom and Amora on the map anymore. They're gone. They're, they have, well, there are those who believe that they have sunk into the Dead Sea, that they're under the waters of the Dead Sea. It could very well be this was the time that the, that sea was formed in the crater that it's in because it's believed, remember, it was a very fertile area. It is believed that the water came down the Jordan River feeding the Dead Sea and went on down to the Red Sea. If you think of your map on Israel, you can see, you know, the Sea of Galilee, you can see the Jordan River, you can see the Dead Sea, you can see the Red Sea, not connected today. But that whole area is what we're talking about. An area known for volcanic activity, an area known for earthquakes, and an area where if it was fertile before, it's totally changed now. They see volcanic ash, they see volcanic rocks, they see a <clears throat> crater that's formed by a volcanic eruption. So they think that all of this is what happened. Now, I will tell you, I think probably a lot of that is what God used. But I think the initiation was very clear from our scriptures. I'll get your question in one second, Dora. Going back to Genesis 19, what I see in the to me very, very clearly, I'm sorry, I'm fighting to get back where I was because I moved it. I have to move it to change 20, my tablet. 21. 21. Is it 21? No, it's past 21. Uh, sorry, I'll be there in just a second. Okay. Then the Lord, verse 24. And that's probably what you said and I didn't hear it right, sorry. The Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. So I believe that it was initiated in heaven. It was not just a volcano that was coming up and it finally mm -hmm. erupted. I don't believe it was an eruption that put lava on the ground like we see if volcanoes, volcanoes erupt in our day. But do I believe that possibly the fire and brimstone rained out of heaven touched off cataclysmic events, the earthquakes, the, the volcanic activity and formed that crater? Very likely. Very likely. But my point in this all is the source came from God. He was the one who said he's sending his judgment. I see the same thing in the tribulation. We read of fires, hails, brimstone. We read of all kinds of catastrophes, one happening after another as the trumpets are poured out, the bowls, the, well, the bowls are poured out, the trumpets are sounded. But we hear about all that, yet we know it's named the wrath of God that that's the name for the whole tribulation period is his indignation. So whether he's using natural, speeding it up, bringing it at his right timing, however he's doing, I won't take away that the natural got involved. Even in the flood, the natural got involved. Mm -hmm. But God's the initiator. God's judgment is what's coming down on them. Remember, the sins had come all the way up. In his ears he had heard. His eyes had seen because he came down and he looked around and saw. And it was worthy of that kind of judgment. Holy righteous judgment but our God does judge and he does judge with fire and it's we're even told in Hebrews it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of God in judgment and that that judgment is fiery so um, whether it was all of the above some of the above it initiated from God and uh, I have no trouble saying it ignited other things down here that's why we see the rocks that look volcanic, that's why you can't see any of Sodom and Amora left. If a house burns down, you see the ashes. The tornadoes that just went through, you see the results. Mm -hmm. You may not know where to find all the pieces, but they're there. They're, they're still on the surface. This seemed to be a, a, just a total annihilation that wiped them off the face of the map. And there's wow. more coming in the same area, so what's left? I don't know. Well, if God's judged them for the reasons that, that were given to us, we know God's judgment is coming again. And we know it's not just in two cities. Yes, it is worldwide. And uh, I remember hearing Billy Graham say, if God doesn't do something soon to judge that sin in particular, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah because it would be unfair to say, well, I took it out on them and I, I let you get away with it. But no, God he has his perfect timing and he sees it all perfectly. Have but, you noticed uh, the weather has been really even different in California? 
And I think it's me wake up, wake up. What I don't like, and I've got to get to Dora and then Roger, what I don't like is the way that um, insurances and people's talking and everything. God gets blamed for all of these things in the negative. You know, the, the earthquakes, the tornadoes, the fires, all are acts of God. When have you heard an insurance company say anything about the blessings of God, the, the, the sun, the refreshing showers? You know, I don't they like don't the negativity. Right they, you know, the, this is the anger of Mother Nature. <laughs> but that's not, you know, a fair assessment and judgment right way to say it. The same way I understand why people say when you ask them something and they'll say, Oh, God's been so good to me. I understand why they're saying that, but I always want to say back to them, could he do any different? <laughs> it's always good to us, no matter our circumstances. So, just my little pet peeve story. Well, I was going to say, is this man trying to explain as to why God needs help from... I feel that way. I feel like they're trying to. Now, at the same time, I do believe that we can see the results in our humanness. But yes, it was almost as if I could hear somebody say, well, it really wasn't a judgment from God. They were living in volcanic era yet. Yeah, you know, they, you know, Hawaii had the, the, the volcano that took out where people live. And that's why I'm steering as far away from that being an acceptable answer as possible. Because we know God had a hurry lot, his wife and his two daughters, the only saved people out because he's bringing that judgment. Not because the earth's going to judge, or the earth's going to do something. He'll use the earth, but it, it, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No excuse. This was a judgment from God. And when people don't like that, and they say, well, that, that's a mean God, and I don't want a God like that, hello, it, 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 a mean God that takes out evil? Really? <laughs> well, I think because we're not taking out evil in our world today, our world is getting more evil. So, and I said, Roger. Like with the prophets of Baal. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll get there. there. I'll get there. <laughs> okay. Good for you, though. <laughs> Roger gets the A for the day. So, um, it, it definitely could be all of this, though, is what formed the cavern that the Dead Sea sits in. Because the water comes down and it doesn't go out and it brings all the silt and the salt and everything else and why nothing can live in the Dead Sea um, for extended time anyway. <laughs> yeah. But then, I mean, if you, if you go into that water, doesn't it healthy for you? Yes, you it go. is because in those minerals are healing and isn't that our God? <laughs> yes, yes. Helps but with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it helps with eczemas. Yeah, you can't live extended time in there. <laughs> I floated for a while, so you can live for a while. Anyway, what about lightning? Was it lightning? Because God, they say, initiates lightning. And we can see that in a sense when we look in Scripture. So let me show you Job. Job, Job chapter 1 and verse 16. Job chapter 1, Job chapter 1 and verse 16 and remember, everything happens to Job in the beginning. He doesn't know why, but everything does. First chapter. First chapter. Verse 16. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Okay, when they say fire of God, that's what, where we get our word lightning. When we translate into our English, this is where we get uh, lightning. Ezekiel 38, I should have told you to stay there also. Ezekiel 38 and verse 22. Let's see if I can get back fast. Okay, I shouldn't have done it that way. Sorry, it'll take me a minute more because I've messed up my tablet now. <laughs> so much for shortcuts, folks. Ezekiel 38. We were there, and we're going to look this time at verse 22. Ezekiel, Hezekiel, chapter 38, verse 22. With pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment with him. I will rain on him and his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain. Uh, I think we did read it earlier, with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. That, again, that word fire, the term of fire of God, that's what, again, we get lightning from. Now, in Job... 
God did not send the fire. Remember who's attacking Job? Satan. Satan. Okay? So Satan, and we know he has some powers, but that the, in Job, it wasn't there. It wasn't from God. But in verse 23 of Genesis 19, with the sun rising, we know that there, this couldn't have just been an electrical storm. Because when we have our storms of lightning and thunder, we don't see the sunrise, do we? <laughs> it's hidden behind the clouds. Mm -hmm. So it had to have been supernatural. It had to have been uh, other than just a, a normal <laughs> electrical storm, a storm of thunder and lightning. It had to have been supernatural fire. Now, I do not <laughs> want you to think for a moment that I equate Satan's power with God's. He is not God's opposite equal. He does not have the power God has, but we do know he has power to work what looks like miracles. You'll see that especially in Revelation when his henchmen do horrible things, when the Antichrist should die and appears, appears as if he has died and yet lives and is Satan indwelling him. So he's been given power. He has more power than we in our normal human state have. But God is the ultimate. God is the supreme. And God does use supernatural fire. Even as one who got an A in the class today has already brought to our attention, let's look at 1 Kings 18. And if you don't know this chapter, I love this chapter. 1 Kings 18 because the prophets of Baal go down <laughs> in, in fire and well, let me just, let's look at 18 and verse 38. It's their defeat, I'll put it that way. Okay, 18, verse 38. Um, maybe I'd better tell you, in case if I've got anyone who do not does not know the story, um, Elijah stood for God in that he is a prophet of the one true and living God. There are the prophets of Baal that have been trying to, to declare their gods as great, and so... Elijah has challenged them. They are each to build an altar. They're to, to each put a sacrifice on the altar, but they're to have their God ignite it with fire. Well, the prophets of Baal danced all day, did everything they could, hollered out. Elijah made fun of them, you know, talk a little louder. Maybe he went to the bathroom. You know, there's all kinds of side lights of what he may have said, but then it's his time to show and tell. And he not only wants to make sure they realize, but he's going to do it in such a way that no one can say anything other than miraculous. So he douses the sacrifice with water. He makes like a well around the, the altar sacrifice, and it's filled up with water. I mean, it is as soaked as can be. And if you've ever tried to light something on fire that's soaking wet, it's not easy. Obviously here, it was, it was not an electrical storm either. There had been a three-year drought. Rain does come later in this chapter because Elijah prays for the rain to come back, but he had prayed for the rain to be held out. And in verse 38, we have here that the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, licked up the water that was in the trench. The fire of the Lord. And I believe that's what we're seeing in Genesis 19, the fire of the Lord. Now, whether he used other means also, even as in the, the flood, it was the breaking up of the fountains of the earth, the um, volcanoes underneath and all, all of that took place in Noah's flood. It could be here the same way, but it's initiated by God. The fire came from heaven. It, in um, the new covenant, the Greek word for brimstone is God's fire. And I want us to see that in that light. That's the way that I think it is. And with God's fire, with judgment, we're going to see that uh, it's really, it's never the same again. It's not a fertile valley to this very day. Remember, it was extremely fertile. It was lush, is what attracted a lot into that direction in the first place. And we're going to see there, there you know, an allusion to this also as we read on. I think we are ready Yes, so we know the fire came out of heaven. We know it was the Lord's fire. We know it was supernatural fire. Whether he used earthly things also or not, it was supernatural. It rained on Sodom and Amorah 
and he overthrew, verse 25, he overthrew those cities and all the surrounding area. Remember the angels telling Lot, get out, keep moving, get out of this valley, don't stay, here is why. Because it fell on the surrounding area, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. So the ground was judged also in this, even as we saw the ground judged in the flood. Is it also possible that uh, Zorro, the city they were going in, it would have been destroyed too, but because uh, he wanted to yes. go there? Yeah, I believe that that's a good likelihood because it sounds like God said, I'll spare Zorro because you'll be there. So it does sound like it that <clears throat> initially God was going to wipe out that whole area also, but he does not um, because of Lot being there. So um, we have, though, that it, it hit... Everything. Uh, it became a vast desert instead of the Fertile Valley. Today the area is covered by the Dead Sea. It has sulfur sulfurous vapors, um, great blocks of salt, not just in the Dead Sea but in the surrounding area. Um, as well as sulfur, the waters are very bitter tasting and some of you can testify with me to the truth of that also. They sting the eyes, they sting any open sores. Be warned, if you've got a, a sore, be prepared because we all know you pour salt to a wound, it hurts. But someone asked me about, isn't it healing? Yes, it's very healing at the same time. I was walking in the sea. I could not see everything. Some areas are very um, murky to, to look through. And there was a pillar of salt that I could not see that on the side of my calf, I felt the slit. <laughs> oh, I felt the slit. I remember it lighting me up. It's like, oh. <gasps> and it was about, you know, a good couple inches long. But I was in those waters at, um, early evening, let's say 7-ish, 8 o'clock about that time. The next morning when I'm getting up and getting going for the day, I happen to notice the cut. I would say easily 95% healed in just the that little bit of time because even when it cut me, it was starting to heal me that fast. I was amazed. In fact, I even showed people because it's like, look, you remember this last night? It was just about gone it was amazing wow. without so, a scar without a scar to this day i i remember where but I, it's a memory it's not anything i can see and uh, believe me i've had little things last a whole lot longer wow. <laughs> so yes yes and they do they send people from around the world to bathe in the dead sea they put on the mud and then they they bake in the sun a little and then they get in the dead sea to wash it off like i said it helps psoriasis eczemas it helps arthritic patients i would love to take my niece and put her in there and a few others that i know uh, but it is it is very healing because of all those minerals the dead sea mineral content is 30 to 40 percent our ocean salt content is around 6%. Mm -hmm. That give you an idea of the difference? <clears throat> All I remember is you get around anybody, and I won't tell the story on camera, but you get around anybody who's flailing, and yes, it stings the eyes, it stings everything that comes near. And they even tell you, they caution the people, and I don't know why they have to, but, you know, we tell people that when you put on cruise control, you can't walk away from your steering wheel. They told people that were getting into the Dead Sea, don't go in, put your head in the water, and open your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay. That's not where the name is. Um, <clears throat> where was, oh, no, it was the Jordan River. Okay. Yeah, Jordan River flows into it, but it doesn't flow out. So all the silt, all the minerals, all the salt came in. came to heal from the leprosy. Was it a name? No, no, on, no that was, um, I can picture it. It's in Jerusalem. Um, Pool of Siloam mm -hmm. that you're thinking of. Yeah, well, not, not the same. So, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I will stand corrected. The Jordan River was where he was told to go dip. Yeah, yeah. seven times, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yes, Roger. Notice was for people like me. I go in the swimming pool, I leave my eyes open underwater. I go in the ocean, I swim with my eyes open underwater because I want to see what's coming at me. Or I'm coming at <laughs> you know, so I leave them open all the time. It doesn't bother me. But it should bother the same you. Thing. There you would, there, I guarantee you, it would bother you there. 
Yeah. Nothing lives in the water, not animal life, not vegetable life. Um, all testimony to the catastrophe that happened there. Um, and I think I've probably covered everything else. Again, it originally flowed to the Red Sea, they believe, through this Rift Valley, but today it stops at the Dead Sea. And they think it probably stopped at this time. And I think they're very likely right, because something made a major change that we see still on our map to this day. <coughs> and yes, Roger, if you go, don't try it. <laughs> okay, so with something else happened too though, verse 26. We know where it all fell, but verse 26 tells us something very sad. But Lot's wife, from behind him, looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Okay, yeah, that's a wow. First of all, the looked back, the Hebrew gives us ideas. She was looking intently. This isn't that she heard a noise that caught her attention. She looked back, and she got in trouble for it. Apparently, her intent was a longing to go back that this is what she was doing. She probably, because the angels had let go of their hands now, she probably was shrinking back. She's behind Lot, and I think she very much had in her mind and her heart, no, I'm not leaving, I'm going to go back. Now, I can't tell you that dogmatically, but I do believe that the indication of the Hebrew is there. Look at chapter uh, 17 of the book of Luke. It also refers to this. Luke chapter 17. Those of you who don't think the, the two parts of our Bible are um, linked together, then how come Luke's telling us about Genesis? 17, chapter 17, verse 28. 17 and verse 28. We start there and we read, It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. The life goes on. Verse 29, but on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone, notice from heaven, and destroyed them all. Okay, so, uh, and I think I want, I want to read a little further. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, the one who's on the housetop, whose goods are in the house, must not go down to take them out. Likewise, the one who's in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. So what it shows is... You've got to leave all the worldly goods behind when, when they're told to flee in the tribulation time. If they pause to, to collect worldly goods, they'll lose their lives because of it. They won't be able to get out. Whether Mrs. Lot was looking back to, I don't want to leave behind my worldly treasures. Maybe she was looking back because maybe she was attached to the sons-in-law, you know, the betrothed men, her friends. We don't know. We don't know. But it, it was not an accidental. This was an intentional. Her heart was back there. Um, it, who knows what she was longing after for sure. But it was complete disobedience to the Lord. The angels had made it very clear. You're to go. You're to get out. You're not to look back. You're to move forward. And she just absolutely was not in obedience with that and paid the consequence of it with her life. Matthew chapter 10. And again, if someone wants to say that's God being harsh, how long were they warned? How long did it take? How much did the angel do to get them out, to separate them? It just it shows her, her heart was not there. We hear Lot being referred to as righteous. We never hear his wife being referred to as righteous. In Matthew 10 uh, and verse 37, it says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. As this goes yes. on, it, it, the idea isn't that the Lord is saying, you have to not care about your family, kick them all out of your life, be told. That's not what it's saying, but if you care about anything more than the Lord, yeah. then then you're not in right fellowship with him. You're not uh, worthy of his service because you're holding back. You've got a, a what did they call it? A, your heart's not, you know, it's too, to too torn. There's a word for it. I can't quite wrap my 
I choose around it right now. Um, yeah, I don't want to say two-faced, but you're double-minded maybe? Not quite the right word either. I still can't think of the word, excuse me, that I want, but the idea is two-faced. Let's just call it two-faced. I see in this very much that, that Lot's wife probably only went along with Lot, but this is showing the real intent of her heart. So whether it was out of sorrow, whether whatever it was out of, she was not in a safe place. Remember, they were told, hurry, go. If they'd made it, if they were in Zoar, if she was in Zoar, she would have been spared. That also gives me the idea, because if your mind is like mine, when you hear the story when you're a little child, you're seeing four people as a unit that are leaving. And it sounds to me, without putting any thought into it, like these four people are still together. But remember, our Hebrews said that she was behind Lot. We also know that Zoar was spared. Lot was in Zoar. I think she was lagging behind and maybe even had started, it doesn't tell us that she started back, so I can't say that, but at least lagging far enough behind, she's in that valley area that the angels warn, get out or you'll suffer the punishment also. <clears throat> So she was fully warned, fully aware. Lot makes it safely. The daughters make it safely. So to me, I think there was a lot more space than a few feet in between Lot and his wife. I think there was, you know, a, a bit of distance there. And if we want to be fully safe, we have to be fully in the arms of the Lord. We, if we want to be obedient, we have to be fully obedient. So that halfway in between isn't going to work. Lot learned that the hard way. Um, and when we are saved, we are fully saved. We're not saved halfway. There's no middle ground. You either are saved because you're in the blood of Yeshua Jesus, or you are not saved. There's no in between. So I, I believe Lot definitely was. He's called righteous. I have my question about his wife. I don't see it speak um, in a way that would make me think she was backslidden. I think she just wasn't there, period. Can't be dogmatic, but just looking at you know what I see and realizing. Um, now, it says she became a pillar of salt. Does that mean literally that you could... You go up to her and put your salt shaker in and take it and <laughs> shake it. I don't believe that's what it's trying to say, but probably that either there was like a, um, if it was volcanic activity that was going on, the volcanic ash or a great glob of sulfur did um, just absolutely douse her and encapsulate her. Maybe kind of like if we look at the victims of Pompeii, um, we can see their, their remains to this day because they're, they're petrified, but they're in that shape that they were in. So ones that were running to get away and got caught right there, they're in that shape. I mean, it's amazing. You can see exactly what the person was doing when, when that came on them. So not knowing exactly what, but knowing it came from heaven, brimstone and uh, sulfur, it could be that it just covered her and that that was just it a, a glob whatever you want to call it it could be that she was just encrusted with uh, whatever did bring her death and it was salty like we say the sea is salty um, so it could have been that she um, she couldn't look like a statue for a time is what I'm trying to say it could be that they could have seen that example what I can tell you for a fact is years ago when we went on a tour through this area and the bus stopped and showed us and said this is the area our tour guide laughingly said yes and they tell us to point out that point over there that that's Lot's wife and we're all looking and we're going what where and they said exactly <laughs> you know it's not something that you can see today like you go to a museum and you see, you know, a wax form. There's nothing like that that you can see. But they will take you so far as to show you the exact portion of the mountain that if you've got a very active imagination, maybe you can get the outline. I couldn't even get that much. <laughs> well, they have something sticking up to say, like a, 
like, you know. You no, know. Here, here's Lot's wife. Lot's wife. <laughs> they certainly didn't put up RIP, rest <laughs> in peace. <laughs> but no, there's there's no markings. You oh. wouldn't even know that as you're going by. You wouldn't oh. even know. And do they know that that's exactly where she was when it happened? Yeah. No, they absolutely do not know that either. So. Uh, it just, I bring it out to you because you'll hear all these things, but the Word of God is what is true. We stay as close to that as we can, and I do believe in some way she was instantly, um, she instantly lost her life, and it was because of her, her um, disobedience, her turning away from God, who is salvation, to the world who cannot save you. So, Lord bless you. I got when they had to go. Sorry, it's folks, fearful. but yes, Lord be with you. Well, so, yeah. thankfully, yes, Roger. Like uh, Pompeii. Yeah. Yeah. We did say Pompeii. Oh. Yes, yeah, yeah. We see human remains in those kind of shapes. We see animal remains. I mean, it's amazing. If you've never seen Pompeii, it's kind of eerie. It's yeah. kind of, uh, but uh, you can look up pictures. Um, I have eyeball seen. And, uh, okay, let's get on to something better. <laughs> well, I hope it's going to be a little while before we get better. But let's go back to chapter 19. And we are ready for verse 27. Now, Avraham, all this has taken place, remember, down in the valley area. Avraham's up on the mountain. Now, Avraham got up early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Remember when the angels of the Lord were with him, it said that he was standing before the Lord. So he went, um, actually, our Hebrew says, where he had stood, and that's, by the way, chapter 18 and verse 22, where that's just recent that we talked about it. Um, it's just taken us a couple classes to get here. But he looked down. That's a type, to me, remember we talked about Lot being a type of being brought out before God's wrath comes down on this earth. That would be a type of the believer caught up to heaven, and then the judgment falls on the earth below. That's called the tribulation. Now, I'm not saying that we're up there looking down on the tribulation happening. I think we have better things to do than that. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be getting our rewards during that seven years. I think we're going to be in such awe of where we are, greeting loved ones who have gone before, meeting the Bible people who are now walking and talking around us, who if you've got questions you want to ask, you can be asking. I don't think there's any reason why we're going to want to be looking at the wrath of God on the world that we are so sick of, we can't wait to get out of. Why would I want to look back at that? Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying we're going to be up in heaven looking down on the tribulation and see what's happening. Maybe we will or maybe we'll see some. Especially we know we will see when heaven opens up and we come back with our Messiah to stop the battle of Armageddon. But understand my point. Abraham was up. He was, in essence, caught up, even though it was not a catching up. And he's looking down on the judgment that has fallen. Go with me to Matthew 11. I should look and tell you ahead of time because you were at 10. I could have told you to stay there, but I don't think when I'm teaching like that. <laughs> Uh, Matthew 11, verse 20. Okay, this is when the Lord's doing miracles, and some are receiving and some are not. In verse 20, then he, Yeshua, began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. They had such miraculous events that should mm -hmm. have caused them to know this <clears throat> is God. You know, the only one who comes from God can do this. Nicodemus said that in chapter 3 of, of Yohanan John, that I know you've come from heaven because only one who comes from God can do what you're doing. So these cities are being condemned because they have seen miracle after miracle after miracle and they're not repenting. Remember even when he fed them with the loaves and fishes, they're showing up right after and the Lord called them out and said, you want more food to eat, you're missing the whole point. You know, they weren't after spiritual food, they were after fleshly food. And so he goes on and he says, with woes to certain areas, then verse 23, and you, Capernaum, you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. You're going to end up going down to what we're going to call hell at this point. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. 
the Lord's saying at this point that if I'd been in Sodom and done my miracles there, they would have repented where you've seen the miracles and your hearts are so hardened you haven't repented. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. How so? Because I fully believe what God is, is teaching here is the more light you sin against, the more your judgment is in the day to come at great white throne before God as a judge because you never came into his gift of salvation. So if someone never heard, never saw much, they lived in an area where there was not the Bible being taught continually, there weren't evangelistic meetings to go to, they hadn't sat under hearing teaching after teaching after teaching, they hadn't been witnessed to by 50 different people all telling them the same thing about the Lord, then their punishment is not going to be as severe as the one who I just mentioned did sit in here. Mm -hmm. So someone who has heard and heard and heard and continually hardened their heart against that light, they go all the way to their death. They leave this earth with never repenting, never accepting the Lord. The Lord's going to hold them far more responsible because they had the testimony. They had the light. So those who were living in Sodom, it was evil and they had a chance. They knew it was called out, even Lot, even in his sinful backsting um, uh, walk. He still was... He, he probably did convict them some, just not, you know, enough to where they changed. They, they saw it and they didn't want it. The Lord's saying those people won't be judged as severely as those who walked and talked with Yeshua Jesus in his earth, earthly form saw the miracles happen. I mean, how can they deny who he was when he opened the eyes of the blind? When he produces out of five little loaves and two fishes enough food for over 5,000 people. When he raised someone from the dead. How could they not? You know, it, that's blatant, willful hardening of the heart. That's Pharaoh on steroids. When the, the, the <coughs> plagues are coming, the plagues are coming, the plagues are coming. And he's realizing he's fighting against the God. His God's little G's, they're not doing it. His God is more powerful. I'm sorry, the God is more powerful. Pharaoh has a lot to answer for because he had a lot that he saw and a lot that he closed his heart off to. And in my heart, I, I become very concerned for certain people, going nameless on video, but who've been around our evangelistic outreaches continually. I do not judge them. I pray for them. There is hope till the moment they leave this earth. That's when I do not pray for them any longer because it has been settled. What state you are in spiritually when you leave this earth is the state you will spend eternity in. Mm -hmm. If you're in the Lord, you'll spend it with the Lord. If you're not in the Lord, there's no second chances. That's it. And those who've been around heard much, given an opportunity, and have hardened their hearts more and more and more, I fear for their judgment. It makes me shake to my core and pray somehow, Lord, still get through to their hearts. Don't let them reject forever. So keep witnessing, keeping a light. I also, on the, the flip side of that, don't want anyone standing at great white throne who would be able to turn back, see me standing there, not waiting for my judgment because I'm in, clothed in his righteous robe, but could see me and say, why didn't you tell me? Now, they're not there because I didn't. God would send someone else, but I still don't want anybody saying that. So I carry in my heart a huge responsibility to be expressing who is my life, who has given me life, who has given me opportunity to share with them. Let me introduce you to my best friend. Let me tell you about what gives me hope. Let me share what helps at this time. And if nothing else, you're afraid to speak, have a tract. Tracts are wonderful to leave behind because they can read them over and over and over again, and you're gone. But it gives that testimony. And if you catch a glimpse of hell, you don't want anybody going there. So we need to be about our Father's business. We need to be... A witness, and that doesn't mean just at the evangelistic <clears throat> meeting. That doesn't mean just when the platform's been set for it. 
That means when you go to the grocery store. That means when you're waiting in the office of the doctor. That means when you're pumping gas. That means those moments when you get cut off by somebody else and you want it and you extend them love instead. Look for the opportunities. There are a million around you all the time and the Lord will guide you how to use that opportunity to be a light for Him. Amen. So, yeah, it's what we've got to do and time is short. It is so short. Don't put it off. And if the Lord is burdening your heart right now for someone, and you're afraid that someone could one day say, well, they didn't really tell me, then don't let tonight end. Just take that to the Lord and let him guide you because uh, nobody's guaranteed another day. Um, I heard someone once years and years and years ago, I don't remember who the preacher was, but they preached on the crucifixion of Yeshua Jesus. And I guess they wanted that impact, so they didn't preach resurrection in the same sermon. They intended to preach mm -hmm. resurrection when they came back. And if memory serves me right, I think that's when the San Francisco fire happened in between. And he never got the chance to have that second time to tell them of the resurrection. Don't stop short. Give them the whole complete story. But don't think on, oh, well, I'll tell them next week. Because they might not come to next week. You might not either. So, Yes. Okay. So... Avram is looking down in verse 28. He sees the judgment that has fallen on this surrounding area. Uh, looking to see if I gave you everything I wanted. I think I did. Verse 29 says, so it came about. Uh-oh, I didn't finish 28. Sorry. I didn't do 28. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, 27. He got up in the morning early, went to where he's, the place where he stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom and Amorah and toward all the land of the surrounding area, and behold, he saw the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. He saw, have you ever seen a fire that's still smoldering? You see the smoke that's coming up. He saw the residue of what was left. Remember, it had been beautiful, it had been fertile, and now what he is seeing is total devastation. If you don't know what that's like, turn on your news. I hate to say it, but there are plenty of areas where we're seeing total devastation, where cities are being annihilated, where there's just nothing left but smoke that's ascending up. What a sad, sad scene. Notice it was quick judgment. It, it fell harshly, but it fell quickly because he got up early in the morning and he is seeing this devastation. He knew it was coming. God had told him. God had told him why, that it was not unjust. He was not an unfair God, but in his justice and in his uh, righteousness, this judgment would come. Avram had pleaded for the saved souls. The saved souls got out, and that judgment fell, and he saw. And it saw like the smoke of a furnace makes me think of hell. It's final. There's nothing that reverses this. So verse 29, it came about when God destroyed the cities of the surrounding area that God remembered Avraham. How did he remember him? By what Avraham had asked. He sent Lot out of the midst of the destruction when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. Notice how he takes full credit. He doesn't say a volcano came, an earthquake came. It says that the Lord is the one who brought this judgment. He brought Lot out. He didn't bring Lot out for Lot's sake. He brought Lot out for Abraham's sake. Not because Lot had earned it. Lot did nothing to earn it. He wasn't living that life that would earn it. And how much that encourages us. When you are praying for one who is at this moment undeserving of the Lord's salvation, of the Lord's, well, no, where, okay, you know what I'm trying to say. If that one is still sinning against the Lord, against the salvation, pray for them. If we have no right to, to judge them and say they've had their chance. They've had their opportunity. Don't ever go there. Abraham stood in the gap. God gave Abraham what he prayed for. Because of Abraham asked, spare the righteous, God spared the righteous. Um, it, it just, I think I've said, I think I've well, what, what's point. it major because a lot at one time uh, he had received the yes, Lord, right? Yes, absolutely. So maybe he was hoping that he would come back to 
to the Lord. I'm sure Abraham was hoping all the time that he would. Yeah. Just as we do for those that we love that are in that rebellion, we pray, Lord, bring them back to those roots. Remind them, make their heart tender again, touch them, and we don't give up hope for that. So uh, God's not willing that any perish, we know that, but judgment does come, judgment does fall, but realize what I'm trying to say is impact we can have as intercessors. God's given us that gift. He, he does not change his mind because of it. That's not what's going on. But he honors that with us. And I think he even puts it in our heart because he wants to work in that way. So, you know, this, this God that's mentioned here, the God that remembered Avraham, this is Elohim. This is the one who is the judge of the whole earth. We see that from chapter 18 and verse 25, that, that this is the one who is to judge. This is not Jehovah. Jehovah is the one that makes covenant. I mean, it is, it, but he's acting in his different name capacity. I've got to watch every word that comes out of my mouth. God is Jehovah and God is Elohim always, okay? When he's acting as Elohim, he is acting in that righteous judge form. When he's acting as Jehovah, he's remembering covenant. He's remembering that relationship. And Lot had separated himself from Abraham. He'd come out from the protection of the Abrahamic covenant, blessing Abraham, being blessed, that sort of thing. He wasn't in right fellowship, but Abraham still stood in a gap, prayed for him, and God in his love saw the righteousness of Lot because it's not merited, it's given undeserved. And he brought him out, even as he put on Avram's heart to pray for, for Lot and ask for Lot. So I hope you understand what I'm saying. There's, there's both sides. There is God as righteous judge, and there's God mm -hmm. as merciful forgiver. That, that it's just like a parent. You're always hoping that the kid would come back from yes, doing yeah, well. just like a parent, hoping that child will come back. Absolutely, and I'm sure we could say Lot if he if we put him into the story of the prodigal son, he's out sowing his wild oats. But what's his father doing? Looking every day, hoping every day that his son will come back. So, and we should have that kind of love for whosoever. Also, don't ever give up on them. And I'll tell you, I hear story after story after story that what brought someone back was the faithful prayers of, and they'll name their aunt, their grandma, you know, their, their, their parent, somebody in the family. They knew, and they couldn't get away from those prayers. Your prayers are powerful, folks, and that, that's what I want to encourage you. Our prayers are powerful. It's a gift God's given us for that intimacy, that growing closer to the Lord, and that being a tool for Him to work through also. When we talk about that destruction, that the, the destruction we just read in verse 29, yeah, yeah, verse 29, it's also... Um, you, the, you may have a, a version that says overthrew or overthrown. That's what we see in Second Peter, Second Kepha, Second Peter chapter two and verse six. When we read there, and this is talking about judgment here, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. Remember how Luke said, "Hey guys." Remember Lot's wife? Well, we even still can call people out and say, hey, remember Sodom? Remember Gomorrah? Remember what happened? You know, don't, don't take this lightly. That's what's being said here. It's an example to straighten others up, to warn others. But the, the same word here for destruction, um, the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, is our Greek word for catastrophe. When Yeshua in Matthew 21, and I'll take you there real quickly, in Matthew 21, Matthew 21 and verse 12, we read there, 21 and 12, we read, And Yeshua Jesus entered the temple, drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple, and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling dust. He turned it all upside down. It's the same word catastrophe, overthrow overturn. What we're seeing is Sodom and Gomorrah were turned upside down. 
when Yeshua chased out those who were making money in the temple where it should have been a place for prayer, they were making it a place of selling in their business, and he turned their tables upside down. It was a total catastrophe. It was a complete physical upheaval. That's what we're talking about. But just as with Matthew in the temple, it was in one specific area. When this happened with Sodom and Amorah, it was one specific area. It was not worldwide. God had promised he wouldn't destroy the world uh, as he did in Noah's uh, time with the flood that he would not destroy the world again in that manner. And that word, which if we looked at 2 Peter 2, 5, you can look that up later, talks about Noah's flood. That word is cataclysm. Cataclysm is worldwide. Catastrophe is an area. So there's your difference when you see it. It was not a partial, it was a complete, but it was a complete in one area. And that area took in the Fertile Valley. Um, we're going to see that people weren't too happy with that. Let's go on in chapter 19 of Genesis and see what I'm talking about. I think we're ready for verse 30. I need to look back at the end of 29 and see if I read it all to you. Yes, I did. When you overthrew the catastrophe, the cities, not the whole world, but, but the destruction in that area, yet it was a complete destruction. And we know to this day, Sodom and Amorah did not build back. A lot of cities that were destroyed by earthquakes and other things, um, we see them come back. We, you know, may take time, may take years, but we see them come back. Sometimes they never do. Uh, Sodom and Amorah, it was a complete um, catastrophe and completely gone. So, verse 30. Are we ready? Yes, we are ready. Yes. Okay, verse 30. Now, Lot went up from Zoar. Remember the little city that he wanted to go to so badly. He went up, in other words, he left from Zoar with his two daughters and stayed in the mountains. So it's just Lot and his two girls now. Now, through fear, Lot finally is going to do what God had commanded. In verse 17, God had said, and I go back up and I read to you verse 17, when they brought him out, that when the angel speaking, you know, for God, the voice of God, escape for your life, don't look behind you, don't stay anywhere in the surrounding area, that's Zoar, escape to the mountains. Okay, so finally, Lot's finally decided, hey, you know what, Zoar isn't so great. This isn't where I want to be. Maybe I ought to go to the mountains. Well, you think, Lot? <laughs> you think God was trying to send you to the best and you took second choice? Yeah, I think so. Uh, but he's going to go this time without God's presence, without God's blessing. I mean, he, you know, it wasn't a great blessing to be yanked out of Sodom. I mean, it was. It was the saving of his life. But you know what I'm saying? He wasn't being blessed like Abraham was being blessed. Uh, but it could be that when he went into Zoar, because we know that God apparently had intended to take out Zoar also, that there must have been evil equal to Sodom and Amorah. Because again, God's not just going to cause his wrath to fall wherever, it's falling on judgment what needs to be judged. So apparently Zoar probably was full of sin also. I'm going to say it may have been the same sin. It may have been more than just that. But it had to been wicked enough that God's intent at first was to destroy it. Now, it could be that that's why Lot's thinking, oh, I, I don't want to live here. I know what comes. The heavy hand of God's judgment comes at the end of this. I better get out. It could be that, that the people were that wicked. Or it could be even also that the people didn't accept Lot. That they had to have realized where he fled from. He's the only one that survived. How did you get out? Why did it happen? Did you escape? You know, are the gods after you? Because they're looking at gods. They're not looking at the God. But it could be that, that they were saying, we don't feel safe around you. You know, you've got a dark cloud over you. We're going to get away before the lightning hits you. Um, it could also be that they were upset with Lot. You brought this on this area. You were the one that you had that mouth that just kept going, that saying this is wrong, this is wrong. And finally it got judged. And look, you took our business away because all that fertile valley, all the, the uh, um, activity, all the selling, the buying, everything that was going on, that's lost now. 
you know, there had been new trade routes, there had been new mm -hmm. areas, you know, to find the supplies and the things that, that were taking place there. So we don't know the reason, but he leaves, he, he leaves Zoar, and his girls go with him. So they go up, and they stay in the mountains again, as I mentioned earlier. Um, they're the mountains of Moab. We know that Ruth comes from that area when we get to that story. It does tell us he was afraid to stay in Zoar. So I think at the very least, they were not looking favorably toward him. They, he was persona non grata. So he goes into the mountains. He stayed in a cave, he and his two daughters. Can you imagine? He's lost everything. The fertileness, the valley, his flocks, his servants that worked for him, because remember his servants fought with Abraham's servants, he's lost it all. He paid a high price for going into the world and lusting after the worldly goods. He's down to just himself and his two girls. He doesn't even have his wife at his side. And we're going to see things still are not good for him either. So in this cave, he and his two daughters, the first one, the firstborn, the oldest, said to the younger, our father's old, and there's not a man on earth to have relations with us according to the custom of all the earth. Okay, according to the custom, or you may have after the manner, what they're basically saying the one to the other is, we don't have anybody to marry us. There's no men. We're it. And barrenness was a disgrace in that day. You were to definitely get yourself a mate and have offspring. So this was not on their agenda. This was not, oh, well, I can live a, a righteous single life. No, they, that's not where they're going. And they're concerned about carrying on. And that comes out in verse 32. Come, let's make our father drink wine. Let's sleep with him mm -hmm. so that we may keep our family alive through our father. Or you may have it say, preserve the seed of our father. And that's exactly what they were thinking. They wanted to preserve the family. They wanted the family line to go down. They wanted to have children that will carry on the family name. And you've got to remember that they've been raised, or at least many years, in the morals of Sodom. So even though they were still virgin, remember, you know, there was compromise all over the place. They saw, they heard, they knew it was not... Not where you want to bring your child up. <laughs> Let's just be... Well, okay, but then they didn't think about it being a sin either, right? Right, right. We'll, we'll touch on that in just a moment. So we're going to see that Lot's going to still continue to reap what he sowed. He sowed wild oats in the fields of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's going to reap that harvest even in his daughters. Because we see what happens, okay, as we go on, and we'll touch on what Dora said in just a moment. So they made their father drink wine that night. Where'd the wine come from? Either they, that was what they carried out, <laughs> which I think, Oegevald, if that's what you thought was your precious things to carry out of Sodom and Amorah, or it's what they got in Zoar, which would give you an indication, again, it was a wicked city. It would be like, you know, the saloons yeah. of the Wild West, you know, that that was what it was like. But anyway, they brought wine with them. They had wine with them. <laughs> and they're thinking, you know, we need family. We want family. They might have even thought, who's going to take care of us when we're old? And we need family to take care of us. So they set about, they're going to do something. They're going to make their father drink wine that night. And they do. And the, so once he's well inebriated, it tells us, um, and by the way, if you... Well, it'll come up. Let me stay in order so that I don't mess us up. <laughs> if, I'll come back to it if I missed it. Um, the firstborn went in and slept with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or got up. That's pretty drunk. He had no idea what was going on. We all know when you drink, you become um, loose with your morals. You will do things that you would naturally do if you were in control. You become a little more free. And so he's, he's in that state. What he's not is unconscious. Don't get that wrong. It doesn't tell us that he was unconscious. It's just he's probably feeling good and having good and going along with everything that feels good. You know, he's got no moral standard yet, no, um, nothing to hold him back. Now, the only thing I can say for the girls is we don't have in Scripture yet incest where they're, they're told, you know, not to have, not to marry in so closely. Because 
who did Adam and Eve's kids marry but their brothers and sisters? There was nobody else. And God allowed that for a time. As we move on and there's enough people on the face of the earth, then God put in to law incest, not to have relations with your own family members. So in their mind, they weren't thinking this is a serious crime. This is something, you know, this is a thou shalt not. But it also, in the way they're doing it, you know that they're not doing it thinking this is right before God. They've got to get their dad drunk. They've got to get him feeling mm -hmm. really good. You know, well, how did they even know that's going to make him feel really good and he's going to do things with us that he wouldn't do otherwise? They had to have seen that behavior around them. So um, we, we see that they do exactly what they wanted. The second night, the, the younger daughter um, also, it says... Uh, um, okay, on the following day, the firstborn said to the younger, look, I slept last night with my father, let's make him drink wine tonight too, then you go in and sleep with him, so that we may keep our family alive through our father. There's their whole purpose. They're not saying, I want to have sex to have sex. They're not saying, you know, that I know it's wrong to do this with my father. They're just saying, hey, we've got no other choice. We've got to have family continue. We've got to have our family line continue. Let's do this. And so they justified in their minds. The second one goes in, and uh, again, he doesn't know when she laid down or when she got up. So what happens? Verse 36, both of the daughters of Lot conceived by their father. He got them both pregnant. Now, here's what happens. The firstborn gave birth to a son and named him Moab. From Moab comes the Moabites. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. Verse 38, as for the younger, she also gave birth to a son and named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day, the Ammonites. So you have the start of the Moabite race and you have the start of the Ammonite people, tribe, whatever you want to call them, okay? Both of these groups lived in the mountains east of the Dead Sea and the, the fruit of carnality it's enmity with the spiritual man. Look at Romans 8. Okay, let's get the contrast here. Romans 8. Romans 8. We're going to look at verses 5 through 8. Romans 8 verse 5 says, For those who according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I think that's a description of Lot's daughters here. They were in the flesh, doing what the flesh sets its mind to do. It was not toward God. It was not pleasing to God. It was not what God wanted. They set aside any conviction, anything that they felt that this was wrong. We're in a desperate strait. This is all that we can do. We're going to go on and we're going to have children. And they want children to help the line continue. Well, look, what, look what, who they give birth to the enemies of Israel. And these were um, originally were not the enemies of Israel. That's what they become, okay, down the line. But Israel was ordered not to touch the territory of either of these, I'll call them tribes, because God had said he gave this to Lot. God, even in Lot's backslidden state, brings him out safely out of Sodom and Amorah and also gives him a, a, a progeny still. Look with me at Deuteronomy 2 to understand what I'm saying. This is where I just see God's mercy, that God does not give us what we deserve and doesn't give us what we do deserve sometimes. Deuteronomy chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 9 and 19. Deuteronomy 2 verse 9, we read, then the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab. Do not provoke them to war. For I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I've given Ar to the sons of Lot as a possession. 
Okay, so they're not to harm Moab, they're to leave it alone, that's their possession, because it was to go to Lot's sons. Well, these are his sons, Moab and Ammon. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 19. What is R? Uh, let me go back to 9, sorry. Um, oh, okay. Um, because I've given R to the sons of Lot as a possession, um, I think it's, it's referring to that area because when you go up, you've got the Arba Road. I think it's shortened form of that. So the area of Arba, the area of R, don't destroy that area. That's what I've given oh, to Lot okay. and to his sons. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, good question. Verse 19. Yes, so I'm verse 19. When you come opposite the sons of Ammon, do not harass them, nor provoke them, for I will not give you any of the land of the sons of Ammon as a possession, because I've given it to the sons of Lot as a possession. So God in his mercy sees Lot's sons born by his daughters, and he proclaims land for them to take care of them. The children aren't suffering the consequences of their, their father. They're not being cast off and can't ever have anything from God. God's not being unfair in that way. He's being more than generous. He's giving them a possession. And because he promised it to them, Israel was to leave those areas alone. Now later, they come to be the enemies of Israel. Their conduct toward Israel is not like brothers or cousins, and they come directly against them. That's in Deuteronomy 23. I'll show you that, but this is much later. It's not the original. It's, you know, we go down some, some time. Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 to 5. God's judgment now is going to come on the Ammonites and the Moabites. And here's where he says it. No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord. That means they don't get to be part of the commonwealth of Israel. None of their descendants to the tenth generation shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord. So for ten generations, ten begats, begat, 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 ten generations down, these people from these tribes, as I called them, will not be allowed to be part of the main assembly of, the Lord, of, of, uh, of God, of the um, house of Israel, the commonwealth of Israel. And he tells why. They did not, this is verse 4, they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Baor from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. So when the children of Israel, much later, we're traveling through, they had just left Egypt as slaves, they're traveling through on their way to the promised land, and they needed help from those, the peoples in the, that area. Now, the people in that area have heard the, the children of Israel, their God, has destroyed the Egyptian army, has parted the Red Sea, the testimony went before them. We know that even Rahab later at Jericho says, we've heard of your God. That's Rahab, by the way, we've heard of your God. So the testimony was out there. That tells me that these Moabites and these Ammonites should have known who they were. When they came through, they should have been willing to help them. You've got God on your side. We don't want to anger your God. In fact, we want blessing from your God for helping you. And they should have helped them when they needed food, when they needed water. They should have helped. And they not only didn't help, but they went to the next degree. And we have Balaam, who was, or Balaam, the king, who hires Balaam to curse. He was a prophet that, that when he cursed you, the curses fell. And he hired him to curse Israel because he was afraid of Israel. He was afraid of Israel's God. He wanted them destroyed. He didn't want them to have a chance to swallow up him and his kingdom. And instead of becoming an ally with them, he decides he's going to, to hire this one to curse them. And if you don't know the story, the story in short, three times Balaam tries to curse Israel. He opens his mouth to curse and blessings come out. God would not let him curse. So God had the final word. Judgment was there. There's a lot more in that story. It involves um, a donkey at one point. Go read. Go read. If you don't know, go read. Very, very interesting. Yes. But they had come directly against the people of the Lord. When you are going to come against the people of the Lord, you're going to suffer the consequences. So Moab and uh, um, Ammon 
even though initially we're blessed with land and safety from the Lord, his hand has been removed from them as they became the enemies of the Lord, and they were prevented from even coming into the congregation of the Lord. Now here's God's perfect timing and his plan, because if you're thinking, you're thinking, well, wait a minute, she mentioned Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess, and Ruth marries Boaz and is in the, literally in the line to the Messiah. So how does that go along with this? The Moabites weren't supposed to be able to come in. How do we get a Moabite not only in, but in the line to the Messiah? Yes. Ruth was the generation after the ten. That's amazing. That's God's timing. She was not the generations that were said, none will come from these generations, but she was the next. Very interesting. Tick tock. God's clock. Is he in control? Absolutely. Is he in control of the evil minds as well as the, yes. the minds that are set toward him? Yes. He, they are not more powerful than God. They do not thwart his plan. And uh, in fact, I can't, I won't get to it now, but I'm going to preface it because it's not going to take anything away. We're going to see very shortly when we get into the next chapter, we're going to see Abraham again compromise Sarah. And she again ends up in a harem where here she's promised to carry the seed. And he's letting her go into another man's hut, so to speak. And God does not let that one touch her. Because had that one, we would not know whose baby Isaac was. Because Isaac's going to come. Remember, it was within a year. Isaac was going to come. If she had had sexual relationships with anyone other than Abraham, everyone could say, well, we don't know who the father is. And I don't think they had DNA testing back then to try to say, oh, Abraham's the father. Besides, we know it was miraculous in how, in how Isaac is conceived. But God protects. It wasn't a righteous king that Sarah went into his harem. It's an ungodly king, but God stops and tells him, you're a dead man if you touch her. You know, God just, he's in control. Nothing, no one thwarts God's plan, is out of God's control, makes him come up with plan B. No, he has planned everything perfectly. It's orchestrated perfectly. We stand in awe. But God uses, and that's how he uses vessels for destruction. He knew Pharaoh's heart would never turn toward him. And when he says that God hardened his heart, remember, it's like I told you earlier today too. The more light, the more judgment comes to you for, for a turning from that light. How did Pharaoh's heart get hardened? By God bringing him light. God let him see more, no more. He turned against it. God knew he would. God used him in that position. God knew that this king, a king that was ungodly, would listen to a God to God when God speaks to him. Stay tuned and find out how God talked to an ungodly man. Very interesting. Because we know how we hear, but how did he hear? But we'll do that when we get there. Now you know I study ahead. <laughs> and you can go read ahead and see what kind of answers you get. So, going back to Moab, going back to Ammon, or, or to, you know, these two people now, not necessarily to their offspring that comes, but going back into where we are, uh, and I have to get back to where it is, I am in verse, okay, I think I'm verse 37, yes, yeah, so that, okay, the first gave birth to son, named him Moab, Moab means from the fathers, it's Moab in the Hebrew, from the fathers, um, so it was her way of saying this is still the line of the fathers coming down. We know this is not the godly line that goes to Messiah. But um, Lot was Abraham's nephew. So, you know, they're still relation. They're, they're cousins. They're in there, okay? And then Ben-Ami, um, the, the second yeah. son, we're in verse 38 oh. of Genesis 19. Oh, we went back. So. We went back to the names of the two kids from okay. the fathers, and Ben-Ami means son of my people. So for the girls, they were saying, this is our family. Remember, they were very concerned to have family continue. That was their purpose for this. And that does tell us that in a short tail way, the Moabites 
were and the Ammonites were related to the Jews because if Lot was Abraham's nephew, then his offspring, you know, these kids are Abraham's great nephew. You know, so they, they were related. If you go back far enough, we're all related. We know that. <laughs> um, we're going to learn about Naaman. She was an Ammonite woman. She was one of Solomon's wives, one of, of King Shlomo's what? wives. Uh, Solomon. David's son Solomon oh. married Naama, N-A-A-M-A-H. I think that's the same in, in English as in Hebrew. But anyway, together, Naama and Solomon have a son. Anyone remember the son's name? Jeroboam. You're very close. Rehoboam. Oh, Rehoboam. Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was from... The one in Jeroboam was from the other when the, yeah. the Israel split. So you were right on top of it. You can read in 2 Chronicles 12, 13. And you can read in 1 Kings 14, 24. So very interesting that they were both in the, ancestral, in, in the ancestral line that does lead to Yeshua. Because look with me at Matthew 1, 7. And remember the Lord's line is not a pure righteous line. Um, it is the line that, that he keeps the Jews, you know, he, he, he never lets there be an end. But you've got Rahab, a harlot. You've got Ruth, a Moabitess. Now you're going to see um, Rehoboam from Naamah, who was an Ammonite. It is Matthew 1 and verse 7. Solomon fathered Rehoboam. Rehoboam fathered Abijah, Abijah fathered Asa, and if you keep reading down through all the names, you're going to finally get down to where you have, um, okay, you have verse 16, Jacob, not, not um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is a different one, but you have Jacob fathered Yosef, the husband of Mary, Miriam, by whom Yeshua Jesus was born, who's called the Messiah. So in Messiah's line is Rehoboam. Rehoboam comes from an Ammonite and from Solomon, who's the, the Davidic line, because Solomon was son of David. So it's just very interesting. God is so merciful, and he doesn't wipe out a whole people um, without bringing out. And he brought out those who would, just as he brought Lot out, he obviously, you know, Rehoboam at a time knew who the God of Israel was. It wasn't a necessarily a good king, but he, he was in the, the line where he would have learned about the God of Israel. So you've got the Moabites, you've got the Ammonites. They started out being protected, having land, and God telling the Israelites, don't come against them. Then they come so harshly against Israel that God allows these people to be destructed, destroyed. Okay, now here's my question. Will these two people be revived in the last days? Now, why do I ask that? I'm glad you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Go with me to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 48. Jeremiah chapter 48. Okay, and in Jeremiah chapter 48, we're going to go all the way down. Whoops, I didn't get it in my tablet. We're going to go all the way down to verse uh, 47. 40. 48, 48, 48, and we're going to look at verse 47. And verse 47 says, um, we've got actually, we can even have in verse 46, woe to you, Moab, because we're talking about them also. But verse 47 Yet, oh yeah, it is the same people, sorry. They're, woe to them in verse 46, um, that they perished, their sons have been taken captive, their daughters in captivity, yet, verse 47, yet I will restore the fortunes of Moab in the latter days. Very interesting. I will re restore the fortunes of Moab in the latter days, declares the Lord. Look at chapter 49 and verse 6, just right next door, chapter 49 and verse 6, but afterward I will restore the fortunes of the sons of Ammon, declares the Lord. When it says he'll bring again, if you have that, or if, or if you have cause to cease, 
in the old King James, what it's talking about is a revival, a restoration. So it sounds very much like God is going to bring back the people of Moab and the people of Ammon in the latter days. There will be those who are restored to the fortunes that have been lost in between. I see Israel as an example of that. Israel went into captivity. Israel was kicked out of her land. Israel was missing out on the blessings that came to her in the land because many of the many of the blessings are promised in the land. Yet God brought her back into the land and fulfilled promises to her then, but greater promises still to be fulfilled that we know will be Israel's in the millennial time that she's never received fully yet because she's never been in that right relationship with God for God to fulfill his word. He, he's not been denied. It's not been delayed. It was all part of God's perfect timing. So I believe in the last days, Ammon and Moab will also be brought back into a restoration. And I don't have the scripture. I forgot to look it up, but there's a scripture that talks about... Um, in essence, God putting his hand over the area of Moab and the area of Ammon, the area of Edom. And it sounds like for protection at this time and this tribulation time. So I think very much that even though they don't know who they are, there are Moabites and Ammonites alive today. And God is going to bring them back, even as he faithfully brought the Jew back and has put the Jew back in his land, yet he's not in the right relationship for the full blessings yet. But that's a God of mercy. That's a God who judges fairly, who is not just harsh and just out to destroy. And I'll get uh, your question in one moment. Well, you know what, maybe let, let me, because I'm gonna make one final sentence and we'll end class on that. What's your question? So, uh, who are they? I mean, are they the um, where are they today? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the area is east. If, okay, if this is your map of Israel and the Dead Sea's here, the mountainous areas here and going down southern, that's the area of Moab and Ammon. So, uh, are they considered Israelites? They they were were they considered Israelites? They came against the children of Israel, so I'm going to say they were not considered Israelites, but they would have been the cousins of them because they're off, you know, the Israelite, Israel came through the name through Jacob. Um, Israelites, Isaac, Jacob in that time, and they're Abraham's nephew's offspring. So they're cousins of. Um, they're, they're, there's a relation there, just like there really is. The Arab nations and the Israeli people, we can take them back to Jacob and Esau, who are brothers. In that same way, they are related. But when we talk about the Israelites and the promises to the uh, children of Israel, no, they were not in that. They were cousins to them. But they were their relatives. Relatives, yes. Because they didn't help them. Right, right. And so they were cut off, and we go down the line, and God talks about them coming back into their areas being restored. We even see Egypt restored in the Millennial Kingdom. You know, God doesn't just do away with all the Arab nations. He restores, you know, he has his purposes. But if you get a map, you can see Moab on Yes, you can see the mountains of Moab. When you're in Israel, they point to the mountains of Moab. They will tell you this is the area that Ruth came from. Yes, yes, you can look up a map today and you'll see Moab. And, and I don't remember if they show Ammon as well. An old map will, you know, a biblical map will. So, yeah, we know we the area. Know, we don't know uh, who, they are. What, who they are. but And it's good to know they're coming back because, I, like, they're not... Uh, Tribulation, will they come out then? Or? I think at the end of the tribulation is when they're restored. So they're going to, there will be some that are believers that make it through the tribulation that will go into those areas that, that their area will be restored also. I see this as important because God's faithful to his work. Even when he cuts off a people for a time, if he's made a promise, he restores those people to fulfill his work. That encourages me for anybody rebellious. In the new world? 
not new world, but in, in the millennium. Source, yeah. In the millennium, yes. Yes, yeah. The millennium has Israel as the head nation, but there are many nations. There are some that never, that, you know, God makes a full end of Babylon and he explains how it's gone. Jeremiah 15, 51, Revelation 17, 18. You know, the, it, you see a total, complete, no coming back. There are those. And God says in Jeremiah 31, there are nations I will make a full end of, but Israel I'll never make a full end of. There are those missing today. Even though the Ammonites and the Moabites, it sounds like there are relatives that we don't know who they are, that in time we will know. We do know there's, you don't find the Hittites, the Gergeshites, uh, you know, they're, they're peoples that have been totally wiped out that have not and will not come back because God made a full end to them. But it's just, I just see God's faithfulness, his mercy, his faithfulness because he keeps his promise in spite of how the people act you know uh, but the, the ones who didn't deserve it because they came against Israel they did suffer judgment for that you know he doesn't say well it's okay because of who your daddy or your uncle was no you, they suffered the consequences but God in his faithfulness said it won't be the end of your line so so you think these are coming back or be Yes, because the ones that go into the millennium, mm -hmm. and I believe if you looked at the scriptures I gave you and you looked at the surrounding, you know it's tribulation time that it's being talked about. So I believe that when they are restored, it's at the start of the millennium. And the only ones who go into the millennium are the believers who have lived out that seven years without taking the mark of the beast, without um, being martyred, and there'll be a judgment. There's a judgment of sheep and goats, and there's another judgment, um, it's Matthew 25 that gives us the three judgments. You see it where for the saved Jews and for saved Gentiles that will go into the millennial kingdom. So, yes, yeah. And I did apparently somewhere skip the verses. If you want proof, I'll look up where I missed it in my notes, but when it says that, that they have relations with their dad, if anybody tries to describe it differently and tell you different, it's the same language when Adam had relations with Eve, Cain came out. <laughs> you know, every time it's used, it's only used that way. These were real people. They were babies that were born. Their, their dad was also their grandfather. You know that old song, you know, you become your... Oh, my old Yeah. <laughs> they could sing it. <laughs> So, okay, so I didn't realize we've gone so late. I hope everybody's clear, and I know I've run over, but are there questions, comments? We can go on with discussion, but I want to tie it up for those who do need to go and are trying to politely not go. <laughs> Any comments, questions before we close in prayer and then open it up to you all anyway? Okay, I'm thinking we're good. All right. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for showing us your power and your strength to keep your word, to keep it faithfully to the umpteenth generation. Thank you that we know that once saved, always saved, that we do not stand in fear of judgment. But Lord, may we walk worthy of your blessings and not of being child corrected because you will lovingly correct us. And we even thank you for that. We know that, that we need both to keep us in line, Lord. But uh, thank you for keeping your word, giving us such security in your word. We know our future. There's no doubt. There is no fear. And Lord, use us. Use us to bring this, this light, this truth to one more that is yet without, that they might be spared coming atrocities and even a worse eternal demise for not knowing you as Savior. Let us be the voice that speaks in the darkness in their life now. May they have a soft heart ready to receive, and may they be saved. Lord, let us come back even next week rejoicing at, uh, of those who have been saved, and especially again as we look at it being Passover time or resurrection time on both sides. Let it be Jewish, let it be Gentile, Lord. Let them both come to know who you are, Messiah and Savior. Thank you that we know. We praise you for our salvation. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Is there a class next week? Oh, oh, no class next week. Sorry, folks. Thank you. Is that what you were going to say, too? Yeah. Sorry, folks. April 5th.
we will go, we'll skip April 5th only. We'll be back on on the 12th. Forgive me, but I've got Passovers on both sides and I'm meeting myself coming and going now. And next week is heavier, so <laughs> I've got to, I've got to be able to, I want to do justice when I do teach. So um, if you're watching on video, you'll go from March 29th to April 12th. But it's only one Wednesday we're missing. Okay, so come join me for Messiah and the Passover. Come join for whatever else we're doing. That you know, you're invited to everything. <laughs> okay, but no class next Wednesday only. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, now open it to the mics and we will go from there. So that was that. There was a lot. This was not the easiest to navigate. But I hope I've made it clear and brought out some points for you to, to, um, to chew on, think on.